In accordance with the customs of this university, I open this ceremony with a prayer. Spiritus Sancti Gratia, Illuminat Centus et Cora Nostra. Amen. Sit down, please. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, public defense uh, in which Dion Foster will uh, defend his thesis, The Impossibility of uh, Forgiveness. And a special welcome to the guests uh, that do not come from this university. Professor Kok of the Evangelische Theologische Faculteit in Leuven, Professor Meiring, University of Pretoria, Professor van der Borgt van de Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Um, Dion Foster wrote a book about the impossibility of uh, forgiveness. I think forgiveness is a very important uh, value in post-conflict societies, in fact, in every society. So I'm looking forward to what you are going to tell us, and I give the floor to you. Thank you. With the permission of the Council of Deans, and in order to obtain the degree of doctor from Radboud University, Nijmegen, I would like to defend in public my doctoral thesis entitled The Impossibility of Forgiveness, an empirical intercultural Bible reading of Matthew 18, verses 15 to 35. This project is an empirical intercultural Bible reading of a biblical text, and it engages the complexity of understandings of forgiveness in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 35 within the context of an intercultural Bible reading setting. And the research shows that forgiveness among South African Bible readers is a diverse, uh, diversely understood uh, topic, and it contains nuanced and even conflicting expressions and expectations. Some have suggested that since these entrenched differences exist, that forgiveness in South Africa may indeed be impossible. In fact, the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation noted that while most South Africans agree that the creation of a united, reconciled nation remains a worthy objective to pursue, the country remains afflicted by its historical divisions. The majority feels that race relations have either stayed the same or deteriorated in the countries, since the country's political transition in 1994. And the bulk of respondents have noted that income inequality is the major source of social division. Most believe that it is impossible to achieve a reconciled society for as long as those who were disadvantaged under apartheid remain poor within the new South Africa. So in order to engage this issue, the study began by problematizing the concept of forgiveness. And it was suggested that South Africans, and indeed South Africa, could benefit from a more nuanced understanding of forgiveness, since such knowledge may help them to move towards the possibility of persons from diverse social, cultural, racial, and economic classes moving towards a shared understanding of what forgiveness may entail. As such, the aim of the study was to produce rigorous, textured, credible, and th uh, credible theological insight into the complexity of different understandings of forgiveness in the reading of the biblical text, Matthew 18, verses 15 to 35. And I'll say more about the choice of that text in a few moments. To gain theological insight into the hermeneutic understandings of forgiveness when participants in this project read the text, they were first divided into an in-group setting. In other words, culturally and racially homogenous, or largely so, groups read the text separately. Then they read the text together in an intercultural setting, and once again after that in an in-group setting, so that uh, data could be uh, found in order to see if there was any change between the first reading and the last reading, having read the, the text uh, together. The hypothesis of the study was that the pre-cultural engagement sessions would show that social identity informed the hermeneutic suppositions of the Bible readers. And we'll comment on that in just a moment. It was also hypothesized in the study that a carefully facilitated intercultural process of engagement with the biblical text 
might facilitate the understanding of the perspectives of the other and possibly even the reframing of the participants' own perspectives in relation to the uh, ideas of the others. So three theories informed uh, the research. First, uh, the biblical text, Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 35, was chosen as a reflective surface, since it offers a rich set of interpretive possibilities on forgiveness in relation to social identity complexity in the Matthean community. However, it was necessary to engage the text in a scholarly exegetical process so as to avoid collapsing the thought world of the text into the contemporary world of the readers. And this was a critical aspect of the study in order to allow for credible engagement with the text itself and also to be able to deal with the perspectives of contemporary readers. Second, Ken Wilber's All Quadrants, All Levels Integral Theory was used as a philosophical framework that provided the language and structure to be able to plot the understandings of the readers in the text. In other words, with that theory we were able to see how the particular readers understood the text and how it was related to their social identity. Third, intergroup contact theory was used to identify mechanisms and processes that could be used to facilitate positive intergroup contact. And so the intercultural Bible reading sessions were structured in accordance with this theory. We now move on to a reflection on some of the major observations of the study, and we will do so in relation to the research questions, the primary research questions, of which there were three. The first research question asked, to what extent do theological understandings of forgiveness differ amongst Christians of different race groups in South Africa? Now, to answer this research question, it was concluded uh, that a, an analysis of the data would be necessary in order to show how the social and cultural identities of the participants in the respective communities, a predominantly black community and a white community, would engage with forgiveness in the text. In group A, the first group in the community, which was a predominantly black or colored community, forgiveness was largely understood in a collective and social manner. In other words, Forgiveness was not only a matter of individual concern, it also had social expectations and social consequences within the community. In this sense, we could say that forgiveness was political. Moreover, this group understood that forgiveness is not only a matter of spiritual restoration between the individual or community and God. Rather, it should be evidenced in the continuum of the restoration of relationships and structures that exist between the divine and the persons participating in the community. For this group, forgiveness could only be authentic if the conditions for forgiveness were evidenced in the community. And that would mean the restoration of land, the transfer of economic power, and the transformation of political structures. An analysis of the results showed that Group B, which was an entirely white Christian community, largely understood forgiveness in individual and spiritual terms. For the majority of participants in this group, the pre-intercultural engagement data showed that they viewed forgiveness as being primarily a matter of being restored in relationship with God. In other words, they confessed that apartheid was a sin, but that sin is committed against God. And as such, the confession of sin would require God's forgiveness and not necessarily require any engagement with the parties who had been wronged in the process. The second research question asks to what extent theological understandings of forgiveness among Christians of different race groups changed in a more integrative manner after an intercultural Bible reading of Matthew 18, 15 to 35. <clears throat> the findings of the post-intervention research data and analysis show that to a large extent, except for some minor variations among the participants, the participants of the intercultural Bible reading intervention developed more integral or shared understandings of forgiveness. Now this means that the participants were far more open to accepting understandings of forgiveness 
that were not commonly held by their in-group community. For example, members of Group A were willing to aggregate their political understanding of forgiveness with a necessity for spiritual understandings, whereas members of Group B came to understand the necessity of social, economic, and political transformation. The data shows that this does not necessarily mean that the participants gave up their views in favor of the other, but that frequently they were willing to aggregate their views in the presence of the other. The third res research question asked, uh, there's a diagram, by the way, that just shows uh, this more integrated understanding. The third research question asked, to what extent is the change in theological understandings of forgiveness among Christians of different race groups in groups A and B, stimulated or facilitated by the mediators and moderators of the intercultural Bible reading practices. Now, the stated objective of the study uh, was to see whether these mechanisms could facilitate a shift in theological understandings. And Elport's intergroup contact theory suggested that certain types of con uh, contact could contribute towards what is called an optimal contact strategy in which intergroup contact anxiety is reduced. And when anxiety is lessened, it could facilitate the possibility of empathy. First of all, affective empathy, the ability to feel how another person may feel about an issue, and then cognitive empathy, the willingness to say, if I can feel or imagine how you feel, perhaps I can understand how you think. So in conclusion, I'd like to share just one story that illustrates this study. The story took place in one of the uh, meetings, in fact, just after a meeting had concluded, where two of the participants were engaged in a heated debate around the need to make economic reparation for apartheid. The black participant was saying that until the land was returned to black members and the economy had been transferred, that there would be no possibility of reconciliation or forgiveness in South Africa. The white participant, in keeping with their hermeneutic understanding of forgiveness, commented that apartheid was a sin, that the sin had been forgiven, and that it was now time to move on, to stop living in the past and stop talking about apartheid. The black participant reframed the question and said to the white member, do you have children? To which the, the white participant replied, yes, I do. And then he asked him, what is your dream for your children? And he said, my dream is that they will live in safety, that they will be cared for in the nation, and that they will have the opportunity to flourish in the years that lie ahead. To which the black participant replied, I share the same dream, but because of apartheid, my dream has been deferred. So in conclusion, this study has shown that at least with this group of persons and under these conditions, some possible shared understanding of forgiveness is realizable. And so to answer the question of the study, is forgiveness impossible, at least within this set of variables, under these conditions, it is possible that persons can share the view of the other. Having presented this summary of my doctoral thesis, I return the floor to the rector. Thank you. I now give the floor to Professor De Heert. Dear candidate, uh, it's my pleasure to be the first one this afternoon uh, that may congratulate you with this well-written and well-organized and very engaged dissertation on forgiveness, a theme that's highly relevant for your own South African context, but in my view also exceeds that context. Yours is an interdisciplinary study working with various theoretical frameworks and various disciplinary approaches in the perspective to come to a better theological understanding of forgiveness in Matthew. You did a great work in describing these different theories and applying them to your research questions. And I especially admired your work with the AQUAL, as I found on the internet, that's the way to pronounce it, 
<laughs> the equal and your exegetical work on Metro, although I have some problems with that theory in general. You did also great empirical work, and your conclusions are, we heard it, uh, you, I heard you saying it, again, are very carefully and modestly formulated, and I value that too. But let me come to my question. Um, and that question is related to your use of the oppositions of social and communal versus spiritual and individual, relation, in, both in relation to the interpretations of Matthew or to the way you formulate that opposition in the social and cultural identity. Um, so you can find that opposition throughout the book in all the parts. And although I'm convinced that you, that both you, and perhaps Ken Wilbers too, want to avoid, yes, even explicitly want to avoid a dualistic or reductionist interpretation of these notions, I could not get away from the impression that your use of these oppositional notions included a difference in appreciation or validation of the social and the spiritual. Contextual theology, notably black theology and feminist theology, have been arguing that the social, be it political or communal, is, or at least can be, spiritual and can be theologically relevant without the need to add a distinctive spiritual or theological or religious dimension to it. So my question is, is the use of Wilbur's equal, that is so dependent on this kind of distinctions. Of, and we saw it in the quadrant you showed. Is that use of that kind of opposition in this way not reinforcing a theological status quo in which the spiritual or the true spiritual or the religious is always separated from or distinct from the social? And is it in that sense not a negation of the theological and the spiritual meaning of the social as such and thus, by implication, also a negation of the black community's theological and spiritual interpretations of the biblical text? Mm. I'd like to hear your reaction, please. Mm. Honourable Madam, thank you for uh, your question. and. Um, I think it's, it certainly is a very challenging uh, question, and I think in large measure you've touched on something that uh, I was aware of uh, in the constellation of knowledge, how one constructs categories in order to be able to elucidate uh, and deal with the concepts that we're dealing with. Now, let me say uh, right at the, at the outset, uh, I tend to agree with your concern that um, any category of knowledge which is placed uh, theoretically like this has its limitations and I tried in the study uh, to show that uh, Wilbur himself and particularly this uh, AQAL theory uh, is contested. Um, it's not without its problems um, and in fact in the limitations of the study towards the end uh, and also in the beginning of the book um, I spell out that uh, I, I look for various theories. In fact for me it would have been uh, far better if I had been able to use uh, a form of knowledge that was indigenous uh, to the African setting. However, one of the complications uh, with that particular approach is that it would have favoured one community over the other. South Africa has a very, very complex social identity. We have two worlds that operate uh, together with one another, sometimes side by side, sometimes in conflict with one another, and two uh, ways of making sense of the world. One is individual, it's westernized, and the other is on a continuum of identity uh, that is uh, not as dualistic as, as Western identity forms. So I think your critique uh, and concern about Wilbur is, is a valid one, and it is definitely something that I think uh, more work can be done on. Let me just say one last thing about why it was chosen for this particular study, uh, and why I think in some senses the awareness of the possibility for, for uh, duality uh, was regarded as, as not so serious that I chose to use this theory. The one thing that Wilbur does do is that he questions uh, what he calls flatland understandings. 
the collapsing of knowledge into either the individual or the social, uh, or into the material or the spiritual, the phenomenological. Uh, so, and he traces that right throughout, for example, the work of Gadamer and Habermas, the two uh, persons who represent uh, the sides of those kinds of debates. So uh, to answer your question, Honourable Madam, I think it would have been, and perhaps this is work that I still need to do, it would have been good to be able to find a form of knowledge which was more indigenous. Uh, but that is still work which I think needs to be done. For this study, however, I felt that uh, Ken Wilber's theory was useful because it gave a structure and some language to be able to identify and deal with concepts that were necessary. I now give the floor to Professor Cook. Dr. Foster, thank you very much for uh, what I consider to be uh, one of the uh, um, best theses I had the privilege of reading. For several reasons, I think the interdisciplinary nature of it is, uh, is, is uh, quite unique. And I think if one understands the South African context, what you bring on the table is quite unique. There, I think in the, in the process of uh, thinking together about what would be wise and what way to move forward, I would like to ask the questions, not necessarily critical about your study, but more on the theoretical aspects of it. If, if, you, if we think about the way in which social identity theory was born, it was from a positivistic uh, social psychology reality in which Western people were studied and the models were designed, or the, at least the approach was, was a result of those empirical research. Then Rockas and Brewer uh, <coughs> developed social identity complexity theory, which tries to, to make the identity aspects more complex uh, and uh, work with nested identities in a more nuanced way, I think, than uh, Tashval and Turner really did. And then we have something else like dialogical self-theory, which is from the social constructivist paradigm, which is something completely different. Now, the other day, we had an interesting discussion against the background of the, the, the decolonialization agenda in your country. And one of the questions that one of the African participants raised was exactly related to this point. Uh, in our research, we use Western models and frameworks of identity understanding that do not reflect the complexity of identity of an African person, meaning a, um, a black African person. Now, one of the um, remarks was made that uh, some of these people experience uh, that we come from, uh, let's say, from a ideological perspective of uh, superiority when we do that, and we need to be sensitive to that. So the one question is, do we really um, uh, need to develop theories from uh, the, the empirical research of Africa? And why have you not tried in your study to also think about the possibility of having uh, developed such a theory also in the sense of doing ground research also? Uh, so how far does, does Wilbur really take us? And is it a better alternative to the other options? And why not dialogical self-theory? Why not more of a social uh, identity complexity theory? Mm. Uh, because all port and social identity is closer than the, the others. So, mm. Mm. Honorable Sir, thank you for uh, your question. Yes, indeed, I mean, that's a, that's a, a crucial point. And I think that um, there probably are two things that uh, I wrestled with in, in developing the study. Um, the one thing is that, in some measure, if you look at the research design in chapter five of the book, you'll see that this was uh, a qualitative empirical study that used mixed methods, but it was largely deductive. So the intention was uh, to test a certain set of hypotheses. And those hypotheses, in some senses, uh, were dependent upon existing categories which were most clearly expressed in intergroup contact theory. The idea was not so much to do the kind of work which uh, my colleague uh, uh, Quibus van Weingart is doing around race identity theory or that particular kind of work. I think there are other persons who are focusing whole studies on the complexity of, of understanding race. In my particular uh, setting, the, the 
project was structured in such a way that we wanted to ascertain, does social identity inform the hermeneutic process? So this was not a, a grounded theory uh, approach. I didn't do inductive work uh, with the communities to see, uh, first of all, what is the social identity? There were some suppositions. So uh, in the interviews that were conducted, the participants self-identified, uh, self-expressed aspects of their identity, and those were then brought into conversation with their hermeneutic understandings of the text. Let me say, however, uh, that what you mention now I think is absolutely crucial. I mean, I, I think it's, it, it is essential for us, uh, particularly in the South African context, to recognize that we need approaches to knowledge that are not dominated by Western thought categories. Uh, and until we can move beyond those categories, we're going to cut out the majority of our population because there are different ways of valuing knowledge and identity. So I think that's a, an absolutely uh, crucial aspect and certainly something which, uh, which I have noted. It is also noted in the end of the study as an object for future research. Thank you. I now give the floor to Professor Mehring. Dr. Forster, as been said before, I really want to congratulate you on a very well-written, informative, good thesis. It was an honor and a privilege to read it and to evaluate it. You may know, as most people here know, that in 1997, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission closed its doors, presented its report to the country, to the nation of South Africa, in, on many instances, many of the chapters of the report, uh, it was said, can the churches, can the theological community in South Africa take us further? What we need now is studies on reconciliation. Churches committing themselves to the process of reconciliation because reconciliation is not an event, a once-off thing. It is a process that will take uh, us uh, deep into the future. It was often said that the churches should do their bit but theological institutions, faculties of theology, theologians should please contribute. And all of us after 20 years feel a little bit left in the lurch by the church community because for, for the last 20 years, the churches involved themselves in many other things. And now that we realize that we are very far from the dream of, of a rainbow country of reconciliation, the churches really need to recommit themselves to the extent that, that Archbishop Tutu, a year and a half ago, called all the churches back to Stellenbosch, your place, to say, brothers, sisters, where are you? What is your commitment? But the same applies to the theological faculties. And that is what you've been doing. And I, th I, I, th I value your, your research very highly. There are two or three similar researches done at your university. Your colleague Desnar, Christy mm. Desnar has written and a few other people have written the uh, foundation that you work for, the Bayer's No Deer Foundation, is doing uh, sterling work in this, in this process. But, but there's a lot of work, work still need, uh, to, needs to be done. Thank you for that, and, and please don't stop writing, but take us further. My question refers a little bit to the practicality of, the, of, of your thesis. Uh, it, it's my hope that not only the, the Methodist Church, your denomination, but my church, the Enkirkerk, the Dutch Reformed Church, and all the different denominations in South Africa will profit from the study. But in, in saying that, I kept asking myself at the end, when I finished reading your, your uh, uh, report, that maybe, maybe there's something else that could have been said. Can I read my question to you? While reading the thesis, I asked myself if Foster, you, would not have done us a special service by allowing for a fourth research question. To what extent did the two groups, as a result of their discussion, reached out to one another, committing to forgive and to reconcile, and hopefully to contribute to the process of forgiveness in their congregations as well as in the wider community? Of course, to talk about reconciliation, to discuss the implications of forgiveness is one thing, but to act upon it quite another. You end your thesis on a very hopeful note. I quote you. You say, as far as the logical understanding of forgiveness, according uh, among culturally diverse readers, readers of Matthew 18 is concerned, the journey towards shared understandings of forgiveness may indeed be a possibility. 
are you really hopeful that group A and group B will take the next step to reach out and to embrace one another? Honourable Sir, that uh, is a deeply, deeply challenging question. Um, and perhaps I can reach just slightly beyond what is contained in the book to say um, that members of both groups have indicated both a desire and a willingness to continue uh, in discussions and to continue to engage with one another towards uh, the possibility of forgiveness and even the possibility of some form of, of reconciliation. I think one of the things that um, really unlocked the potential of this approach to research was that it was a practice orientated research study. And so uh, in that sense, uh, Professor, the the problem, the research problem that was identified has a problem owner. And, and I mean, I'm part of that problem, but the problem owner is the Methodist Church of Southern Africa that has two churches in the same town. And one of them is predominantly white and the other is predominantly black. And they separated uh, because of South Africa's racial history. Uh, in fact, racism as it exists in the human person. And uh, so this problem owner is deeply committed. In some senses, we could even go as far as saying that they were the ones who commissioned the research. They were the ones who said, we have this problem. We want to understand why is it so difficult for our members to forgive one another? And this is just one modest or small contribution uh, towards that. I can say that um, part of the study's intention was to identify uh, and understand to what extent do the mechanisms of positive intergroup contact contribute towards a positive engagement with the other. And uh, my hope is certainly that uh, the findings of the study uh, do make some valuable contribution, that where we can lessen intergroup contact, it deals to some extent at least with prejudice of the other and it creates an openness uh, towards what may lie ahead. So I am extremely, extremely hopeful. Uh, I can say uh, on, on a separate note uh, that we have a small unit at the University of Stellenbosch called the Unit for Innovation and Transformation of Church and Society. And that unit is working uh, with what we've done in this study to develop some processes, some mechanisms, and to train some persons who can facilitate uh, these kinds of intercultural Bible reading processes. If I can just say one last word on that. Um, the biblical text is central to this study. The reason that a text was chosen is because South Africans regard the Bible very highly. It's an authoritative text. But often we don't question how we understand it and use it. And so this unlocked a logic. It helped us to see that sometimes what we entrench in our social identity ends up in our theology. Thank you. I now give the floor to Professor Van der Borg. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Foster, uh, dear candidate, um, I'm, 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 grateful for the, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, discuss this work with you. You told me about your research um, in Stellenbosch and um, I was impressed because I know quite well about contextual Bible reading, but the way you, re you related it to the con concept of forgiveness and a Bible text in relation to that and then with uh, a mainly uh, uh, white and a mainly black congregation, I found it um, um, very challenging. What would be the result? I've read your research and um, I found it very learned, a lot of theory, um, uh, interdisciplinarity, so I was quite impressed. But as a systematic theologian, I still had a question. And um, I'm, 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 I read a sentence from your introductory chapter. There you say, the findings show that there is a logic behind the socially informed, theologically under understanding of forgiveness that are expressed by the participants. And then you continue, hence, this holds value not only for biblical studies, and this is quite understandable because it's in the field of biblical studies, but also for systematic theology. Um, in general, and South Africa public theology in particular. Um, I, when I listened to your introduction, it struck me also how careful and how moderate you were in your last sentences about the meaning of what you said. Now, that even 
um, uh, trickles me even more to question you, but what could then be the systematic relevance? So if, <coughs> if you know, we, we, we have a tradition in systematic theolo theology of writing handbooks in which we try uh, to, to give a summary of what the Christian narrative is about. Mm -hmm. Now, an aspect of it is on reconciliation, and specifically on forgiveness, but in what way would your contribution contribute to that? So if, for example, I have, I have two colleagues from the big, uh, Van der Kooi and uh, Van der Brink, they have quite recently written a, a, mm. a, a kind of a handbook on systematic theology, mm. um, and there's also a chapter there on, on, on reconciliation and a few paragraphs on forgiveness. If you would read that, of course we don't have the text now for you, what would you think, what kind of sentences would you add to that? Mm. I think there is a relevant, but I would like to hear it from you now. What is the systematic theological consequence mm. of your research and the importance of it? Mm. Honoured sir, thank you. Uh, oh goodness, I knew that question was going to come. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as you know, this is, this is my second uh, book and, and in my first uh, major research project, which was a systematic theological project, I also dealt with the notion of social identity, um, and particularly a, a Trinitarian understanding, the fact that uh, intersubjective identity, uh, the encounter between persons, is a primary shaper of who we are, and that's a very Trinitarian way of uh, thinking. It's, for, in, in some senses, what I tried to do in that study was to show that while aspects of our identity are constructed, they're socially constructed, there are certain aspects of our identity which are ontological. Uh, because we, in some ways, represent uh, economically what is imminent in the Trinity that, that comes through. In relation to this uh, particular study, I think that, that um, for me there are probably two, two aspects that still need to be mined. Uh, and hopefully this will be my work over the next number of years. The first one is, um, and, and this relates to Professor De Hart's question, uh, and indeed to Professor Cork's question, that in an African theological setting, we cannot do credible theological work without doing it in community. The only theology that makes sense in our context is people's theology. Mm. And there has to be a rich interchange between our traditions, our texts and our sources, but also how people make sense and meaning of their lives and the lives of others, particularly uh, as in, in the, the text I deal with uh, persons like uh, Steve Biko or cited Ramorse and others who think that the ethical implication of the encounter of the other uh, is a central aspect of, of our our faith construction. So that's the one thing I think which is important. The, the study in some senses provides uh, a methodological possibility for a different way of doing systematic theology uh, that operates within community. And of course there are people who, who have approached systematic theology in this way through base communities in Latin America, even people like uh, Princeton's Migliori and others uh, have done this. The second thing I think is that um, for those of us in, in Protestant Christian traditions, the importance of the biblical text cannot be underestimated. But I think sometimes as systematic theologians, we're not rigorous enough in our interrogation of how we use the biblical text. We sometimes even do proof texting. We take texts and just assume that they are uh, flat, that they're just uh, normative texts. So in, in some senses, that was what I wanted to uh, try and address in this text, that we need a complex, nuanced and textured engagement with the concept of forgiveness, uh, which is so central to our faith. Just a very yeah, brief, very uh, short. It, brief. It, thank you. It, it looks to me that what you are telling me, they are very important, I recognize them also from your study, but it doesn't relate to what forgiveness is. So it's about, it's about method you talk, it's like a bit like prolegomena, uh, but what in the understanding of forgiveness? Well, the, just, just a short question. Yeah. A, a Certainly. Short on it, sir, um, the, the, the one thing that's absolutely essential, and here I, I need to confess I had help uh, from Professor Smith, 
who is a senior colleague at, at Stellenbosch, now at Princeton University. And he uh, encouraged me to read uh, a number of things, together with Professor Fossler and colleague uh, Helghard Pretorius, to go and read the works of Paul Ricoeur, uh, Richard Kearney, uh, to look at Derrida's notions. And I think one of the essential aspects that this study tries to explicate is that a transactional view of forgiveness is insufficient. Okay. When black South Africans own the land and the economy has been transferred, will we have dealt with the ongoing violence of the denial of humanity. Okay. So we need something more than that. And I think that's what the study tries to show. It's more than just transactional. It needs something which has theological content. Thank you. Thank you. A request to the next opponent. Can you shorten your introduction and come to your question uh, straight away? Yeah, so, so I would like to join in the praise of your, of your thesis, but I'm not allowed to. So I <laughs> immediately come to my question. Um, and uh, in, in, it also refers to the, to the second uh, chapter where you present uh, uh, Ken Wilber's integral AQAL uh, theory. And uh, I fully understand the, the function of this theory within uh, uh, your uh, uh, thesis. And uh, I also appreciate that, that, that function, and I, I think it, it helps, even though uh, there, there are some problems. But um, in, in, in a certain sense, um, one, sometimes one can, theory, one, one can take such a theory um, as, as, as a thing on its own. And uh, um, after all, it is a philosophical theory which, which claims to be a valid theory. So my question refers to the theory as such. And um, the theory claims to be a holistic approach, claims to be an integral approach. And, um, but after, I would say, when looking at the history of philosophy, after Hegel, philosophical theories, which claim to be integral or holistic, came under suspicion. And the reason is uh, that such, such a theory must not only be able to give a general account of reality, but at the same time, it must explain ex its own status mm -hmm. within reality. And uh, uh, as you rightly point out, purely subjectivist uh, theories or purely objectivist theor theories can do that in principle, but uh, the price they have to pay is that, that they are reductionist. That, that's why you uh, um, have chosen this theory. Um, but uh, if, we, if we say that we have to accept that both dimensions are irreducible, then we have to recognize a certain kind of dualism and not of, of, of an integralism. Mm. And, and so I think it is rather a, a, a dualistic theory and not, not a, a, a holistic or. And to, to explain that, I would like to draw your attention to page 50 in, on your thesis where you provide a figure. I think it's figure four if I'm, four, if I'm right. Uh, and there you have those four quadrants with uh, different validity claims. And my simple question is, um, if the theory itself, so the AQAL theory, claims to be valid, which kind of validity claim is that validity claim? Is it a subjective, an ob or a truthful claim, a truth claim? Uh, a justness claim or a f uh, functional fit claim or something else? Or is this, is this question nonsense? Mm. Yeah, that's my question. No. Honorable sir, definitely not a nonsense question. <laughs> in fact, very difficult. And in truth, um, I'm not sure that I could give an answer. Uh, it, it, it would be, I think it would be problematic for me to give an answer mm. in, in that sense. I mean, there, there are persons who, again, devote the whole of their academic careers to just engaging this particular theory. Um, and I guess that that's one of the weaknesses of, of having to uh, choose a theory and instrumentalize it, uh, use it as a tool to achieve a certain aim. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that is one of the weaknesses. And I, I do try to highlight the weakness of that particular approach uh, both in the introduction and the conclusion of the study uh, where I speak about the limitations. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I can say ab about uh, Ken Wilbur, which was one of the reasons why I, I chose for this uh, particular theory, is even though... Uh, so what I needed was I needed a, a theory that would be able to build a bridge between 
constellations of knowledge uh, that were identifiable, that could be um, that could be expressed, given terminology, but forms of knowledge which perhaps don't easily get captured in those ways. And w Wilbur's theory was the only theory that I could find that dealt with notions like belief uh, or culture and wouldn't collapse it only into mm -hmm. uh, identifiable aspects like political affiliation or race identity. It recognizes the complexity of the interplay. Now, the one thing, uh, and I, perhaps I shouldn't say this in an exam, uh, Rector, but the one thing that I couldn't deal with, uh, the theory is AQAL, all quadrants, all levels, was the levels aspect. There are a couple of footnotes and one or two paragraphs about that. So I've dealt with aspects of it um, at a fairly elementary level, aspects of the theory at a fairly elementary level. In other work, I've done it far more uh, carefully, but here I didn't have the space to do that. And I think that's perhaps what I'm sensing you're picking up, that uh, that, that aspect is important and credible scholarship needs to take note of, of that catch-22. The moment you use any theory that mm -hmm. describes itself as integral, that can be problematic. Yeah, 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 thank, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I now give the floor to Dr. Sterkens. Dear candidate, first of all, I would like to concur with the compliments of the previous speakers. Of all the compliments I heard, there are two things I haven't heard so far, and that is these two things. That in the big forest of scientific publications about the wide variety of topics you deal with, you have shown to be able to select and apply high quality publications, I think, and that in itself has secured the quality of your work. And secondly, you also accurately applied the broad theoretical frameworks in your empirical study. It is a bit, uh, it's a bit um, outlandish maybe that you also write yourself about your own research that you present a rigorous and meticulously articulated understanding of your fieldwork that is scientifically sound on page 148, but okay, since that is not completely untrue, the concept of forgiveness is not <laughs> applicable here. Thank you. <laughs> now my question, are the churches in South Africa and the Somerset West Methodist Church in particular ready to fulfill all of Alport's conditions for positive intergroup contact or to what extent? And if not, will they ever be? And I ask you so because it looks that belonging to a certain congregation rather depends on race, culture, language, and socioeconomic standing, like you describe, rather than on religious conviction. Mm. Honorable sir, thank you uh, both for the compliments uh, and the question and the honesty. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I don't think that those two congregations are yet in a place where they would be willing to fulfill all of the conditions that Alport mentions uh, in terms of positive intergroup contact as, as a precursor to uh, notions of forgiveness or even uh, further than that reconciliation. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, one of the challenges we have in South Africa is that the church remains one of the most segregated spaces uh, in our nation. And as you rightly point out, that does have to do with social identity. There are cultural choices in liturgy. There are linguistic choices in terms of uh, worship songs and preaching. Uh, and one of the most pervasive elements, which uh, I see very little work being done on, is, uh, is class barriers. Uh, where there are intercultural churches that are deliberately intercultural, they are very seldom interclass. So it's persons of different races uh, who occupy the same class. What this study uh, wanted to test was whether there was any possibility that under a very carefully facilitated process with an authoritative normative source, the biblical text, some possibility may be created where that willingness could be stimulated. And I think certainly in this study, we saw that, that that is possible. The work is by no means done. This is not the end. I think it's only the beginning. 
satisfied? More or less. I now give the floor to Dr. Castillo Cuella. Dear candidate, congratulations with your very actual and useful research. You reflect on theories and describe practices that aim to bring people together in a divided society. Let me start now with a remark. In your research, you applied the methodology of intercultural Bible reading. In this process, you called the group meeting after the intercultural meeting the post-intercultural moment. A limitation in your book, and that is my opinion, is that you do not offer a deep introduction to the intercultural hermeneutic, especially the meaning of interculturality. In that hermeneutic, the moment, this moment uh, of postcultural moment, um, is known as an intracultural moment, because this does not occur outside of a process of intercultural, intercultural, intercultural uh, moment, interculturation. Yeah. The effect of this inter intracultural dialogue is the intercultural transformation. Mm. And Hans David explains this as, the, as to understand through the eyes of another. My suggestion is to use the term intracultural instead of post-intercultural. So now I come to my question. Uh, on page 216, you wrote that your conclusions about the dynamic between the communities are not norma normative because of the limitation of your research. You are cautious about your conclusions of the effects of your experiment. Although, I am very curious to know more about these effects. That is why I would like to ask you, what do you expect of the future of the interracial relation among this group, precisely these groups? Do you expect that this intercultural experience will have any effect on the Christian communities of the participants? So I invite, to, I invite you to do a kind of prediction about this development. Honorable sir, um, I think it was Niels Bohr who said, uh, prediction is dangerous work, particularly when it's about the future. So, <laughs> um, the only thing that I can say is that, I mean, one of the, the, the most wonderful things for me about undertaking this study, and it, it, I really learned so much uh, in doing it, was being introduced to uh, a body of literature and uh, a, a body of research, in South Africa in particular, the work of Houston and Swart, uh, the work of Borman, uh, and I learned from uh, 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 Dr. Sterkens that the or even some further work that has been done, which shows that uh, mere contact is not enough. And we have, throughout South Africa, uh, unfacilitated mere contact in the workplace, uh, in school, in society at large. And that often enforces prejudice uh, because what the research shows is that we seldom then deal with the other. Rather, what we encounter is our prejudice of the other, and we take that to be true. So I think what this study aims to suggest, and again, as you rightly point out, in a very modest way, is that intentional facilitated contact has the possibility of opening up new constellations of knowledge, new ways of understanding both the self and imagining the other. The very last uh, quotation in the book is from Martha Nussbaum, uh, who says that it's only when we can uh, facilitate, imagine, what it is to be the other, which of course we cannot fully do. I mean, I can't even understand myself, let alone another. But when I begin to create the willingness to understand the other, that it becomes possible to create social institutions that rehumanize persons. And I think that's what this study wishes to contrib contribute, is a carefully facilitated process based on an important uh, social source, the biblical text, 
uh, which can create the possibilities for different racial engagements in South Africa. So my prediction is, if we were to do it carefully, I think we would see some positive results. Thank you. We still have some minutes for a second round. May I invite Professor Mehring to, to raise his second question, if you have one. Just, uh, yes, but put, Sorry, thanks. Uh, you chose to, to, for the title of your research, the impossibility of forgiveness, because obviously you, you deal with a biblical text, uh, but you use the word for forgiveness all through this, this study, uh, not using the word reconciliation that much. Is there a reason for that? One often hears that uh, uh, the word and the, the notion of reconciliation is becoming oppressive, that people don't like the word anymore, mm. that people say we need other words. Uh, Miroslav Wolf says we need to talk about embrace. Mm. Desmond Tutu says let's talk about Ubuntu. Mm. Do you have thoughts on this? Honourable Sir, um, indeed I do, um, and I recognise uh, just how contested this particular discourse is, particularly the discourse around forgiveness. Uh, John Brewer, who is a person who works in this field, particularly in Ireland, uh, in a conversation with me suggested, why don't you use mercy, because forgiveness is so contingent. Um, but this text particularly, Matthew 18, 15 to 35, highlights an important aspect of the South African political and social construction. In other words, forgiveness is a contingent concept and we will not see reconciliation until there is some form of acknowledgement of uh, past guilt and the need for present work, particularly uh, amongst those in society like myself who are privileged. And until we are willing to deal with those kinds of very difficult aspects, uh, a concept like mercy wouldn't be enough. My work with young black activists, particularly over the last year or so, has shown that uh, black South Africans are they're tired of showing mercy. Uh, it's been 23 years and we are less reconciled than we were in 1994. Uh, white South Africans are more wealthy than they were before the end of apartheid. So something is wrong with that picture. And I think in a nation where 85% of persons profess to be Christian, uh, we have a responsibility to, to help our members to understand the contingency of this very particular theological term. It requires the, the agency of God, the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to be free from some of those material things that hold us. But it also requires a tremendous amount of, of hard work in society. So in that sense, I think forgiveness is, is an important uh, term. Um, the work of, of Jürgen Moltmann inspired me particularly, uh, particularly as a theologian of hope. Um, I often thought to myself on that day, the day of the eschaton, will there be unforgiveness? And of course there cannot be. Uh, on that day, persons will be forgiven. Our decision now, our ethical choice to make is where do we position ourselves in relation to that inevitable shalom. And that needs to find its way into our political, economic, policy, social uh, structures. Thank you. Professor Koch. Oh, Professor Koch, no, last question. Um, inherently in the, in the work of, uh, of Wilbur is a, a Buddhist philosophical framework that works with um, a conceptual, conceptualization of identity that goes through certain developmental stages. And at the end, one gets to this non-dual experience. Now, according to him, then, one could learn a lot from Buddhism. And what would you in future do from an inter- religious, theological perspective on this topic? Honourable Sir, that, uh, yeah, that's a, a massive challenge and it's a challenge I think for two reasons. The one is that I'm not sure that South African Christians have yet been exposed to a significantly multi-religious social environment. We're a predominantly Christian country, and even though our constitution is a, is a, a, a recognizes multiple faiths uh, and tries to create space for all of them, we do still see 
uh, general expressions of Christianity uh, dominating uh, throughout society. So I think there is a tremendous amount of work that still needs to be done uh, in this area. I see the pedal coming. I'm getting nervous. <laughs> The defense is hereby <coughs> concluded. I give the floor once again to the candidate. Having defended my doctoral thesis to the best of my ability, I would like to thank the rector and my supervisors, Professor van der Watt and Professor Hermans, as well as those guests and friends who have honored this ceremony with their presence. The doctoral examination board retreats for its deliberation. The Council of Deans of Rabat University Nijmegen has decided to award you the degree of doctor. I invite Professor Van der Watt to discharge the task assigned to him. In the name of the Lord, with the power entrusted by law to the Council of Deans, I hereby confer upon you, Dion Agnes Foster, born in Harare, the title of doctor from Rabat University Nijmegen, to which are attached all the associated legal and customary rights and duties with respect to academia and society. As proof thereof, I present you with this doctoral diploma signed by the rector and the doctoral thesis supervisor. Please sit down. <clears throat> On behalf of uh, your promoter and co-promoter, uh, I address you as dear Dr. Uh, Radboud Professor, uh, 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 Doctor, dear Dion, <coughs> congratulations with this wonderful achievement. This PhD does not only reflect your academic abilities, but also express your passion for South Africa and the relations between the Rainbow Nation's different people. Over the years, you have been intimately involved with this issue on different levels, from training students, talking about the issues on the radio, organizing international meetings for the United Nations, preaching from pulpits, and so I can continue. I am convinced that in time, you and your contributions to the South African people will be highly celebrated. And this was mentioned in the committee room also. We expect a lot of you. It goes without saying that I have huge expectations personally and will watch your activities with pleasure from my retirement chair at home. <laughs> <laughs> I've promoted uh, around 50, and that will be more than 50 when I finish, PhDs now. And your PhD is unique in its interdisciplinary nature. Academically, we have grown into a, the mold of a single discipline 
specialization, which is in many case, uh, aspects not bad. But you have shown how several different disciplines can come together in a fruitful and indeed plausible way in, in, in addressing a problem for which many people feel there is no real solution. And the South Africans stress the importance of your work that it is close to impossible to do this type of research in South Africa today. And mm. I think I must say to this defense that uh, you, you take the honors for that, that you and your person could manage to present the world, international academic world, with this view into what can be and what is and what we should strive for. And uh, this, I think, Ratbo can be very, very proud that this research appeared at Ratbo and there is not, not nothing like this. And uh, that, that uh, I think we should at least mention uh, at this uh, occasion. Promoting this, um, yeah, you've illustrated how biblical material may still influence Christian communities. And you mentioned how important that in South Africa still is, no? that that's our the authoritative text, text, uh, text in South Africa. How the power of discussion can change people. Promoting this attitude and approach to the South African situation will most certainly bring some of the change needed. And as influential lecturer at Stellenbosch University, you are a perfect place, or you are at the perfect place to promote this. Now, I must say just, uh, we uh, uh, discussed many things, but one thing perhaps I've never discussed with you, uh, I was uh, in my younger years a minister in a, in a black uh, colored church, as we call it, people of color in, in the midst of the 86 when there were uh, huge conflicts. And uh, as a minister, uh, um, I felt there should be forgiveness and reconciliation. And I was in a town called Fort Beaufort and uh, where uh, people of color were not so welcome in white churches. And we said, what we're going to do, uh, the church council, we're going to invite the white people to come to us. And I remember standing in front of my little church um, uh, with all the people in the little congregation watching down, we were on the hill, which looking down uh, at the town, the white town down there, we lived up here. And then at 11 o'clock, I remember, I, they saw this whole procession from the white uh, little town coming up because they say the whites will not come. <laughs> and we filled that church and that changed the community. So talking about practice, whoever asked or think fit or so on, asked the question of a practice. I know and I had faith in your research from the very beginning because I'm convinced that this is the road, only road perhaps that we should take. Thank you for the privilege to travel the road with you for nearly 20 years now. I still remember our meeting in front of my secretary's door at Pretoria where we agreed to work together. At that time, I already admired the excellent job you did as uh, academic dean at the Methodist Training College John Wesley in Pretoria. Our joint radio program always has a bittersweet, uh, has bittersweet memories. It was the most popular program on Christian radio. That was the sweet memories. But on your way back home one day, a car crashed into your beloved Vespa scooter and you broke your leg. Yes. <laughs> Even today, I feel a bit guilty about that. Uh, <laughs> since you came to the radio program on my request, a broken leg did not deter you or our cooperation that lasts until today. And I really appreciate that. Your positive attitude, your wonderful way of dealing with people, your, resolute new, uh, you, your resoluteness to do things unashamedly ethical, your involvement with what you believe is right, and your friendship are things I consistently admire. I can continue in this tone. 
but that will take considerable time, <laughs> something I do not have at this joyous conversation. <coughs> In the end, two phrases sums, up, uh, sums it up for me. Congratulations, Leon, with a wonderful job that stretches far beyond what we have in writing in this PhD. And secondly, I'm proud of you. Thank you, Professor. Also on behalf of the Council of Deans, I congratulate you with your uh, doctorate and your uh, book. And of course, I include your family in this uh, congratulation. Uh, I think it's a work that we can, Radboud University can be proud of and I hope that uh, we can continue the collaboration between our university and Stellenbosch. Uh, you are not a beginning uh, scholar, and I think there were quite some uh, questions that, that maybe deserve some elaboration. And I was particularly struck by the, the idea to develop a uh, uh, theory of identity f uh, rooted in African realities. Mm. Maybe that is a next research project for you. Mm. Uh, nevertheless, uh, once again, uh, Thank you very much and uh, congratulations. And uh, we are proud of your work uh, at uh, Radboud University. We are going to conclude this uh, public defense and I ask you to stand up. Gracias tibi agamus omnipotens Deus pro omnibus beneficiis tuis qui vivis et regnas per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Amen.